Good afternoon. It is one o'clock Central Standard Time at the Dallas STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to say a special thank you to Acadia Park, Edwin Keast, Sidley Lanier from the Dallas ISD, and Ruby Young from DeSoto ISD. If you're watching and you have not registered, please go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register, sign up. We need this just for our attendance records. Today, we're gonna to do a program called Patterns of Objects in the Sky. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that there are recognizable patterns in the natural world among objects in the sky. Students will observe and describe the patterns of objects in the sky, including the appearance of the moon. Uh, Ms. Fuller would give you a program about the moon. Ms. Nash will discuss clouds. Ms. Ramirez will talk about day and night. And Mr. Monroe will do seasons. And now I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Fuller will talk to you about the moon. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Uh, I have a, a model of the moon. Um, we only see one face of the moon. And over here on this side is the westernmost point of what we can see of the moon. And on this side is the easternmost portion of what we can see. So this is the face of the moon that we see. We never see the backside. We have pictures of the backside from spaceships, astronauts, etc., satellites, whatever. But this is the side we always see. This is the side the ancient people always saw. I'm going to share my screen with you. And our segment here is called Phases of the Moon. I have a, um, a quotation from Juliet in the play, Romeo and Juliet. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, who monthly changes in her circled orb, lest that thy love be likewise variable. What Romeo, what Juliet was saying to Romeo was, don't swear, swear by the moon because it changes every time. And I don't want your love for me to change. I want it to be the same. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see different phases of the moon. Where the title of this program is recognizing patterns in the sky. And the phases of the moon are a very recognizable pattern. The first one is, like I showed you on the model, the, the moon does rotate, but it rotates only once a month. It spins as it circles the earth. This is why we only see one side of the moon. It's called a synchronous rotation. So it's tidally locked as it revolves around the earth and the earth is tilted on its axis at 23.5 degrees, but the moon is also tilted on its axis, but only about five degrees. So when we look up at the sky, we see the same image. So some cultures see a rabbit in the moon. Some cultures see a man's face. It just depends on where in the world you're from as to what you see when you look at the moon. Now, we also have what we call the phases of the moon. As the moon uh, orbits the, the earth, as it goes around, as it revolves around the earth, is exposed to different uh, amounts of sunlight, uh, it, half, of, half of the moon is always illuminated, just like half the earth is always illuminated. Uh, it's always daytime somewhere on the earth. Well, it's the same way with the moon, except we don't get to see that illumination. The moon does not have its own light. It's simply a reflection of the light from the sun. So depending on where it is in its orbit around the the earth it depends on what we see when we look up in the sky. The first quarter or the first, the first phase of the phases of the moon is called the new moon and it's all dark. And then it goes into a waxing crescent first quarter waxing gibbous and then we have the full moon. 
Uh, today's the 25th of February. We will have a full moon on uh, February 27th, which is Saturday. This is another illustration uh, showing essentially the same things, uh, except you see the rays of the sun uh, pointing down and you see why we see uh, those particular uh, sides of illumination or slices of illumination. Remember, the new moon is the dark one. So now what does gibbous mean? The word gibbous comes from a word meaning humpback. Gibbous moon is one that appears to be less than a circle, but more than a semicircle. Our moon has a waxing gibbous, that's the one on the left. That means that uh, the illumination is growing larger and a waning gibbous, which is the one on the right. And that means that the illumination is growing smaller. If something wanes, it grows smaller. If it waxes, it grows bigger. Now what's a crescent moon? A waxing crescent moon can be seen in the western sky a day or so after a new moon. It slips below the horizon with the setting sun. Waxing means growing. A waning crescent moon can be seen in the eastern side before, lunch, before dawn. Waning means getting smaller. They used the, <clears throat> excuse me, people used to call this an old moon, but the, the moon is just the same age uh, as the rest of the solar system. So it's not any older than, than it was before. They just called it that because it looked, because it looked old to them, I suppose. The crescent is the, the illumination of the moon that kind of looks like a, a, a toenail or a fingernail up in the sky. The new moon appears to be totally dark. It rises and sets with the sun and it crosses the elliptic with the sun. It represents the first stage of the lunar cycle. Now, this is one that sometimes uh, people struggle uh, with because they think the first quarter and third quarter moon mean the first quarter of the lunar cycle and the third quarter of the lunar cycle. It doesn't mean of the first quarter of the moon is eliminated and the third quarter of the moon it has to do with the length of the cycle, not the illumination of the moon itself. The first quarter moon occurs approximately seven days after the new moon, and it represents the first quarter of the cycle. It's waxing and half of its face is illuminated. The third quarter moon occurs approximately seven days before the new moon, and, uh, and it represents the third quarter of the cycle. It is waning and the other half of the face of the moon is illuminated. So let me stop my share. Okay. So when we talk about the phases of a moon, of the moon, it takes about a month, about 29 and a half days for the, the phases of the moon, a, a lunar month. Um, this is something you as a third grade, as a second grader, can keep up with and if you will draw it every every night when you look outside and see the moon, draw what you see. And at the end of one or maybe two months, you'll definitely see the pattern of the phases of the moon. Um, I'm, if you have any questions about the phases of the moon, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer those. So I'm gonna turn, him back, uh, turn you back over to him. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. And a student did have a question. Uh, does the moon have layers? And yes, it does. Just like the earth has layers, the moon uh, crust, the mantle, and the lunar core are the layers of the moon. And now we're going to hear from Ms. Nash all about clouds. Hello, welcome to my classroom. It's a cloudy day out there today. You know yourself gray and cloudy just solid clouds. Clouds are really interesting to observe. Some of them are really beautiful. So we're going to look at some pictures I took on a really some beautiful clouds I took. Let me find my cloud pictures. There they are. Okay. So this was a day a couple of weeks ago. I went outside and I was looking at the clouds. And I was thinking about my favorite, one of 
my favorite poems about, I think it might be clouds. Can you read it with me? It says, white sheep, white sheep on a blue hill. When the wind stops, you all stand still. When the wind blows, you walk away slow. White sheep, white sheep, where did you go? Look at those beautiful clouds. Do they look kind of like sheep? Maybe kind of fluffy, like white woolly sheep. But in the poem, the blue hill is the sky, right? So they're comparing the clouds with sheep, and they're so beautiful. This other day, so one day the sky was really blue and beautiful, fluffy white clouds. But then another day I went out and the clouds were kind of gray. So this day it actually rained a little bit. So when you see a gray part of that cloud, it has more water in it and it might fall out, and like get enough to fill out of rain or even snow like happened last week. Here's another great poem by the same woman, Christina Rossetti. Can you read this one with me? Who has seen the wind? Neither I nor you, but when the leaves hang trembling, the wind is passing through. So look at those clouds in the wind. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I, but when the trees bow down their heads, the wind is passing by. So this day, I went outside my backyard and it was so windy and the trees were bent, blowing around and the clouds were moving really fast too. So see these, you can see how that wind is just catching them. And I think some rain might be coming out of that dark cloud there. But you can really see how the wind is blowing those clouds around. And also up in the mountains here, see that dark cloud and see that? That's the rain coming out of those clouds. And at sunset, as the sun goes down, it paints the clouds in beautiful colors of that sunset. So again, we can see those clouds like moving across the sky, seeing this a long way out of the mountains. And again, here, you see that rain coming down out of that dark cloud. And again, a beautiful sunset. So here it is just before sunset. And then see how that sun painted those clouds. So really beautiful. Now, there are three main kinds of clouds. So it's a fun thing to start observing them. And the three main kinds, everyone's favorite kind, I think, is the cumulus. So big puffy ones, sometimes they have rain in them in the summer, especially the big thunderstorms come out of these clouds. They can get very tall. They go up a long way. Cumulus. Kind of in between kind of cloud is the stratus, okay? And they're kind of in, be kind of not as tall as those cumulus ones. And my favorite are the ones we call syrups. And they also, also call them mare's tails, okay? Because they're kind of like a horse tail. And they're often very high, very high and kind of wispy cloud. So I'm going to make a cloud here. Now, what's a cloud made of? Well, water that evaporates, okay? So we have evaporation. Okay, you've heard that word before. Evaporation means that the water turns into a gas. It goes from a liquid to a gas, and it goes up. If it goes up high enough where it gets cold, then it condenses. So we have condensation, and that's what forms the cloud. So that water vapor becomes tiny droplets of water, water liquid water. So I've got a little bottle here, okay, and a weird little thing on top. I'm going to snap it shut and then I'm going to squeeze this bulb here. And as I do that, it's pushing air, more air into my bottle. And as I push more and more air, it gets harder and harder to push that. Push more in, I can't push it anymore. Now, as I push it in, it's just all squeezed together. It gets hot. It's hotter in there. 
And then when I release the pressure, it's going to cool off. <gasps> and it made a cloud because it condensed. Okay. So as it condensed, it made a cloud. Pretty amazing. So a fun thing to do is observe the clouds and also you can draw them like I did with my little pictures here. Or you can take pieces of white paper and tear them and glue them down or even more fun, you can take a couple cotton balls and tear them apart and glue them down and make some clouds of your own. So I encourage you to observe clouds and have fun learning about them. Thank you. And if you have any questions, Dr. Gorman would be glad to answer. Thank you, Ms. Nash. And one student wanted to know, do clouds come in different colors? Uh, clouds come in many different colors, depending upon which colors are scattered when the light travels through the atmosphere. But black, white, and gray are the most uh, dominant colors that we usually see. Now, Ms. Ramirez is gonna to talk to you about if it's different today or night. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're gonna be uh, making some observations about day and night and what causes it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and then we'll start our presentation. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what do we observe during the day and what do we observe during the nighttime? So what are some objects you see during the day? And then what are some objects you see at night? And if I were to ask you guys to draw a picture of the daytime sky and then draw a picture of the nighttime sky, what would it look like? And also think about what are some patterns that you might notice as a day goes on. So you can either pause the video to do that or I'm just gonna go ahead and show you some examples. So here's our daytime sky. So usually during the daytime, we're lucky enough to see our sun unless it's a cloudy day. And then usually during the nighttime, we typically think of the moon and the stars. Now, most people don't realize this, but our moon and the stars are always in the sky. It's just that the sun is so bright during the daytime that it oftentimes will drown out uh, the brightness of the other stars and our moon. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is the apparent motion of the sun. So we're gonna watch this little video and I want you guys to make some observations about what you guys are seeing and noticing. Now notice what direction does the sun appear to be rising in and what direction does the sun appear to be setting in? And do you think the sun is really moving or what's really happening here? So hopefully you guys were able to notice that the sun is not the one that's actually moving. Instead, it's our planet Earth that is moving. It is rotating or spinning like a top like you see here in this video. So the reason we call it the apparent motion of the sun is because it's giving the appearance that the sun is moving. But in actuality, we know that the sun is not moving. It's actually the earth that is moving. It is rotating. And how long do you think it takes for the earth to complete one full rotation or one full spin around its axis? And if you were watching the video, you probably uh, saw the answer to that. If you look at our um, numbers over here, it takes 24 hours or one day for the earth to complete one full rotation around its axis. And hopefully you guys can see that our sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. So it looks like the sun is moving across the sky as we progress through the day. But again, the sun is not the one that's moving. It is planet earth. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video and we're going to take a look at a demonstration. So here I have a lantern and it's going to represent the sun. And then here I have a globe and it's gonna represent, of course, our own planet Earth. Let me just move my little demonstration over so y'all can see it. So make some observations about this model that we have set up here. As what are some things that you notice? And also think about limitations of my model. So when I say limitations, think about things um, that might not be accurate with my model. So the first thing that I noticed about my model is my distance is not to scale, but also what do you notice about the sizes in my model? Uh, so we know that in my model, I'm using a lantern and my lantern is smaller than planet Earth, but we know that the sun is actually much bigger than planet Earth. In fact, if you were to look at uh, the doorway, so if you're in your classroom right now and look at your door, if the sun were the size of that doorway, 
planet Earth would be the size of this tiny dime here. Uh, so that just puts into perspective just how much bigger the sun is compared to our own planet. Uh, so here we have our sun, and then here is planet Earth. And what continent do we live on? So hopefully you guys said we live here in North America. And um, what we're going to do, we know that the Earth rotates or spins. So rotate just means to spin. So imagine a spinning top. And the Earth actually spins counterclockwise. So what that means is imagine a clock. Counterclockwise means that it turns the opposite of a clock. So the opposite of a clock would be going backwards like this. So the easy way that I remember the direction the Earth spins is by, um, I went to A&M and we say it's the gigam Aggie sign. So it's just a thumbs up. Uh, so if you put your thumb up like this, the direction that your fingers are pointing to is the direction that the earth is rotating or spinning. Uh, so for example, if you have your thumbs up, take a look at your fingers really quick. We can see that our fingers are turning toward the right in this direction. So that's the direction that the earth is spinning. And our earth spins around an imaginary line called an axis. So in our little model here with our hand, our thumb can represent the axis. And then here in my model, um, I have a stick to represent the axis. So the axis is just the imaginary point through which the earth will rotate or spin around. So let's go ahead and use our demo and let's see what happens. So we live here in North America. So right now is this model uh, representing daytime or nighttime for where we live here um, in the US? So hopefully you guys said that this model right now is representing the daytime uh, for the US because this part of the globe is directly in front of the sun and it's receiving the sun's rays. Now, what do you think the other side of the globe is experiencing over here on this side? So hopefully you guys said that on the opposite side of the world, uh, people on this side of the globe are experiencing nighttime. Now we said the earth rotates or spins and it's gonna do so counterclockwise. So the uh, sun is actually the highest in the sky around noontime. Uh, so we're gonna call this noontime. The earth is gonna rotate counterclockwise throughout the day. Uh, eventually it's gonna get to right here. So now here is the US on this side. This is six hours later, and this is gonna represent sunset. So sunset uh, typically occurs anywhere between six or seven, depending upon uh, the month and sunset will occur in the western sky. So the earth's going to continue rotating again and then six hours later, notice North America is now on this side. This represents midnight and we know that here in North America where we are is now experiencing nighttime because we are no longer uh, facing the sun. The earth is going to continue rotating and then you see North America start to pop up. About six hours later, North America will now be experiencing sunrise and the sun actually rises in the east. The earth continues rotating and then six hours later, it is back to the afternoon time for where we are in North America. So the earth's rotation, the spinning around its axis is what causes day and night. So the sun is not the one that's moving around. It's actually the earth. Now it is important to note that the sun is also uh, rotating too. So just like our own planet rotates or spins, the sun is also rotating around its own axis just like this. Uh, so that's the sun and uh, the earth and that's rotation. And how long again does it take for the earth to complete one rotation? So hopefully you guys remember that it takes 24 hours or one day to complete one full spin or rotation. And then the last thing we want to talk about really quick is just safety with our sun. So you never want to look at the sun with your eyes. Uh, the sun is so bright, it can damage your eyes. So that's why it's always important to wear sunglasses uh, to help protect our eyes, even wear sunscreen to help protect your skin from the UV radiation that the sun emits. Now the earth actually has a special layer in the atmosphere called the ozone layer, and it's just a layer of gases. And those layer of gases help to protect us from a lot of the harmful UV rays from the sun. It doesn't catch all of it, which is still why we need to wear uh, sunglasses and sunscreen when we're out in the sun for long periods of time. 
Uh, so the next thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna practice a little poll and you guys are free if you would like to, you can participate in it with me. We're going to stand up and if you're by a chair, just push your chair in so you guys don't get hurt. And we're gonna learn a little poem to review what rotation is. Now we learned that the earth spins around its axis. So you can take a finger, put it on your head and your finger is gonna represent the axis of your, the planet Earth. So here we have our sun. You guys are gonna represent planet Earth. And remember what direction does the Earth rotate in? Hopefully you guys said counterclockwise. So if you need to remember, help remembering what direction you're supposed to spin in, again, do your thumbs up sign. My fingers are pointing in this direction, so I'm gonna be spinning this way. So uh, you guys are gonna repeat and follow along after me. So again, get your axis up. And again, remember what direction you're spinning. So axis up, and here we go. Rotation, rotation, let's talk about rotation. We're gonna do it one more time. So axis on. Rotation, rotation, let's talk about rotation. Causes day and night. And again, causes day and night. And then the sun going across the sky and the sun going across the sky. So we're gonna do it one more time. Again, your axis on, figure out which way you're spinning. And here we go. Rotation, rotation, let's talk about rotation. Causes day and night, causes day and night, and the sun going across the sky, and the sun going across the sky. Uh, so what we learned from this segment is that rotation is simply the spinning of planet Earth around the axis. And it's that spinning motion that causes day and night. And it creates the appearance that the sun is moving across the sky. But again, we know the sun is not the one that's actually moving. It's actually our planet Earth. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today on rotation and how it causes day and night. We're going to give it back to uh, Dr. Gorman, and he's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And a question that came in was, what is the longest day of the year? And in the Northern Hemisphere, it's June the 20th. And also, what is the shortest day of the year? And that is December the 21st. Now, Mr. Monroe is going to tell you about the seasons. Students, <clears throat> my name is Mr. Monroe, and uh, I'm going to be helping you investigate <clears throat> changes that go on because it, we're moving from season to season. And uh, season actually is a time of the year when we can expect certain kinds of weather because of a pattern that is set, a weather pattern that is set for particular times of the year. And I'll also try to explain why that happens toward the end. But to give you a little more information, in fact, before I do that, I have some drawings I wanna share with you. We know that when seasons change, it definitely has a, an effect on our plant life, especially trees. I have a drawing of a tree right here. Hopefully everybody can see that. And it looks like it's dead, right? I want you to remember that. Then I have another drawing and this drawing of a tree, very similar, except there's something else on it. It looks like little pink flowers. And then I have another drawing that looks like this. And it definitely has some green growth on it. That green growth, on the limbs, we refer to those growths as leaves. And then something has happened. Those leaves have changed color. So looking at the four drawings, that kind of tells you in a way that some changes have gone on because of seasonal changes. Now, what I'm going to do next is share my screen and go over a short PowerPoint with you. And we're gonna come back to those little drawings and discuss those later. So bear with me.
And here we go. Four seasons. There actually are four seasons. A season is one of four periods in a year. Each season lasts about three months. In each season, there are changes in temperature, how hot or cold the air is, the weather, and even the length of daylight that happens during the day that does have an effect on the living things that live on our planet, whether it be some of the animals or plants. Why do we have seasons? Simply because, now you heard Ms. Ramirez talk about the rotation of our planet, but our planet orbits around the sun or revolves around the sun. And see, that is another motion that is a little different from a rotation. Now, the seasons are caused by the Earth's position in relationship to the sun. The seasons change as the Earth moves closer or further away from the sun. And I want to explain that to you in a little more detail. You see, our planet doesn't set straight up. It is tilted on what we call its axis. And that is it at an angle. So as the planet revolves around the sun, that angle causes some of the locations on our planet to receive more of the sun's heat and light energy, which causes a change in temperature overall, and maybe even a change in the type of precipitation. You know, some places don't have seasons, and there's a reason why. Some places actually are closer to the center part of our planet, meaning that they are very close to a, uh, I guess you would say an imaginary line that separates the top part of our planet from the bottom half of our planet. It is called the equator. And so those countries or those locations that are located pretty close to the middle around that equator, boy, they don't really have any seasons. They stay warm or hot all year long. These places do not move closer or further away from the sun because of the tilt of the axis. Because of this, these places stay very warm, like I said, all year round. Now, what are the four seasons? Of course, autumn, winter, spring, and summer. Autumn, we can definitely tell that something is going on there because we see changes in plant life. Sometimes we call autumn fall. And we call it fall simply because the air outside may begin to cool off. Leaves of some trees will start changing color and eventually they will drop off. They will fall to the ground. And then from fall or autumn, we move into the winter season. Remember, each season lasts about three months. Winter is the coldest season. Uh, ice can form on land and plants. In some places, snow may fall, and winter has the fewest days of daylight or fewest hours of daylight. And then we fall into the next season, which is spring. Now, when spring comes, I actually call that, and some most people call that, the growing season. It's almost like everything wakes up and begins to grow again. Leaves will start coming back out and turning green and animals such as the animals that don't like cold weather, they will wake up from this deep sleep that we call hibernation. For, for example, like a snake or a reptile that can't stand cold weather. In fact, we have snakes and reptiles like turtles that live in our forest, our post oak and uh, we know right now, if we were to visit the Post Oak Preserve and walk those nature trails, the chance of seeing a snake or a turtle probably would not see because what they're doing right now, they're in the ground hibernating, sleeping. But it won't be long when we start having warm air come in and there's more daylight during the day. These animals will wake up. And we also see some changes in the trees over there. Most of our trees look like that first drawing that I saw you, they look like they're dead. 
And all it is, is a state of what we call dormancy. They are dormant right now. They're not growing. They're almost like the animals. They're almost hibernating. And again, when spring comes, everything starts to wake up. And we start getting rain that will also stimulate or help things grow. And then we come to the last season, summer. Now, when summer comes, it gets very hot where we live here in North Texas. And uh, I know you guys will start enjoying that because there are some things that you guys will probably start doing. You know, autumn, we see that colorful leaves. Leaves start falling from the trees. Some of the colors would be red, yellow, orange, and brown. The weather begins to get colder in autumn. It's like I was explaining. But when winter comes, oh boy, winter is the coldest time of the year. Snow falls in the winter. And you know, normally we don't get a chance to see snow, but last week, I think a lot of people were glad when the snow left. We got lots of snow and we got ice. Ponds and lakes freeze in the winter and our ponds out here at the Environmental Land Center, they did freeze. And our lake, it did freeze, okay? Because we had some very cold air temperatures. You know what? Something else happens in the winter. A lot of people look, for, look forward to, and that is the holiday of Christmas. Spring. We are now getting ready to move into the season of spring because spring happens in March. I believe March the 21st is the first day of spring. I may be wrong, but I'm thinking that's it. And uh, I guess it's also related to a very important time when we take a break from school. It's called spring break. Now that is also the growing season because things will start growing because we start getting a lot of rain and we start getting some warmer temperatures. We get more sunlight. Flowers begin to grow in this uh, season and leaves begin to grow back on the trees. So the post oak preserve will look like it is full of life because the weather starts to get warmer. Summer, wow. A lot of things happen in the summer. Uh, summer is the warmest time of the year. In fact, a hot, I call it the hottest time where we live. The water gets warm so you guys can go, everybody can go swimming. I'm looking forward to going swimming myself this year. There is no school in the summer, although there will be quite a few students, I would imagine, that will be in summer camps and summer school. But you know what? That is just to enrich and to help you uh, learn a little bit more about what you're supposed to be learning during the school year. But actually, no school in the summer. Now, what I want you guys to think about is this. What are some of the clothes, what are some clothes that you might wear during each season and why? Draw a picture of the things that occur in each season. And you guys have seen the drawings that I have. In which season, and think about this, in which season is Halloween, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Remembrance Day, okay? Now, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and we're gonna go back to those little drawings that I had, okay? And when we get back to those, let's see if you can figure out what season they represent. Think about this, the tree looks dead. Hmm. What do you think? Winter? Yeah. How about this one that has little pink flowers on it? What do you think? What comes after winter? Spring. What about this one? Now we have leaves and the tree looks like it's full of life. Might, be, might even have some birds in it. Uh, okay. What do you think? summer. And then what happens? The leaves start changing color and look, we've got some leaves that are falling off the tree. So what season is this? I would say autumn or fall because the leaves are falling off. And then guess what? 
the seasons start all over again. So it is a pattern that is going to constantly repeat itself. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman because I think I've run out of time. So if any of you have any questions, I want you guys to ask him and maybe he can answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Question came in from Isabel at Keist is why can't we feel the earth spinning? And it is because we are spinning at the same speed that the earth is. So we think we're sitting still. Thank you, how did we do? Uh, teachers, if you have filled out a form, www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and send it to us. We would appreciate it, uh, your input and your feedback. Thank you very much.